Coming up on Up at Noon, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 reviews are in, and it sounds... okay. Horizon Zero Dawn gets a very cute plushie, and when it's time to Mario Kart, we will Mario Karty hard. All that and more right now on Up at Noon Live. No, you can't cancel the show. We've been doing it for like 87 weeks. Are they trying to cancel us again? They're trying to cancel the show again. Well, hang up on them. I don't want to cancel the show. Is that it? I just hang up on them? Yeah, just hang up. You gotta hey. find, it's like a button, though. It's not hey, like, a, I'm gonna it's like the red thing. I'm going to hang up on you, and then we have to make the show forever. Because that's how phones work. Yep. Suck it. Yeah, that's a true thing that just happened. For Loser. Real. You saw it here first live on Up at Noon Live. Hi, everybody. I'm Max Scoble. This is Brian Altano. And this is Up at Noon. This is a very silly show. I have great news for everybody who's watching us live. We have the chat monitors back. I don't know why I'm pointing. You can't see them. But uh, Omar Yusuf just said, no. Did they put your chair low and my chair high? Because I feel tall as hell today. This really? Is not, yeah, look at this, think, man. Well, I'm up here. Is this know. what it's like to be up here with you? you no, I think it's just because you, you just lost weight and you just feel longer. Anyway, um, <laughs> we've got a lot of stuff lined up for the show. It's a very, very busy, exciting show. Um, oh, yeah. First of all, if you're watching us live... There's a lot of ways you can do that. We do this every week, and it's still stupid. Uh, you can watch us on IGN.com, IGN's PS4, Xbox One, Apple TV, Roku, Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube channels. I was going to do fingers for all of them. Platforms or whatever. Out immediately. Uh, but the easiest way to get a hold of us, aside from the chats on Twitch and YouTube, which we're actually watching, uh, Tiger Ruby says, yay, chat monitors. That's right. I can read it. You can also use Twitter to use the hashtag up at noon live. Or just up at noon. This is up at noon. We do this. Just up at noon. 80, what is it, 87 episodes in? We That's still what it get is. It right? Yeah. Anyway, um, this week we are sponsored and presented by Cheese It Grooves. Uh, and they've, uh, they've, they've given us something very special. A studio audience. Do you want to cut to the studio audience? Let's take a look. They're very excited to be oh, here. Oh, look. They're coming in. They get all the, they're going to have some snacks. They're, com- they're, they're late. You guys got here before the audience did. But they're look happy. Them. Look at that. Oh, Hi, man. guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming. Thanks a lot for being... They don't well, care. Well, they really they they don't do care, care that we're about us. doing... Anyway. Uh, yeah, so uh, if not, you would like great. to win not only a six-month supply of cheese at Grooves, but also a Nintendo Switch and a copy of Breath of the Wild, head to go.ign.com slash cheese at Grooves and find out how to do that. I've heard that game is pretty good. Breath of the Wild? Yeah, I've heard a few good things about it. I'm meaning to try it one of these years. Yeah. You've, you're, you're, a, you're a loon. You're a, <laughs> a crazy man. Um, now, before we get into the, the, the bulk of the show, which we've been working on all week, a bunch of stuff just blew up really quickly recently, so I wanted to kind of blow through that just really quickly. Uh, first things first, one of the biggest pieces of news out of the week is Call of Duty's year, year the, the game that's coming, the Call of Duty that's coming out this year is WW2. It's about World War II. If you couldn't figure that out, uh, we got a bunch of coverage up on IGN. Uh, people seem to like... Kind of interested in this on the basis that it's not future stuff anymore. Ju- judging it sh- uh, by the sheer amount of upvotes versus downvotes that the one got last year, I think they're already in a they're in good territory. Yeah, um, uh, Marty Sleva has a preview up on IGN. You should read; it's really really awesome. Uh, how do you feel about this one? Uh, more interested than usually, mm-hmm. but you know, I, th- I feel like I say that every year, and then we just get kind of exhausted about hearing Call of Duty, and then yeah. you know, I play it for twenty minutes, and I'm like, oh, I, I'm gonna go over here and go out and look at the climate tree outside. Uh, anyway, in other news, uh, Nintendo announced this morning that they sold the Switch sold 2.74 million units. Mm-hmm. Here's a picture of one of those. So imagine 2.74 million of those in that little box that it comes in. Yeah, stay tuned after the show. We're actually going to slide through this picture right here 2.74 million yep. times. Oh, There's look at another that. one. That's two of them. That's, That's two. a start. It's so, we're getting there. So one point. I don't know the math. Yeah. More of that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yesterday was April 26, which, if you look at it in the certain way you arrange things, it's 426, which is the same number as LV-426, which is the planet from the movie Aliens. So they decided that that's a good day for Alien Day. Mm-hmm. It's a stretch. It's sort of like May the 4th be with you, but not quite as... doesn't roll off the or tongue March as well. March 10th is Mario Day. Yeah. It's a, it's a thing that happens now, apparently. But that said, they did a bunch of cool Aliens announcements. Uh, NECA announced that they're doing not only this cool uh, kind of Kenner-styled retro uh, Vasquez action figure, but also... Uh, Look behind the, you! The new, <laughs> the new Xenomorph from, uh, from Alien Covenant, so that's cool. And then Reebok did uh, Aliens-themed sneakers. There's the Queen on the left and Power Loaders, which are just so cool. Uh, yeah, they also, they're very steamy. They're like 325 bucks for two sets of shoes, and that's a matter if you can get them. Those come out in July, though, so if you're one of those, like... Sneaker men, you can always pre-order those or whatever. It's when uh, they come with the most steam. In other news, uh, speaking of steam, there's a lot of steam in this photo from World War Z. Uh, it was announced this first thing this morning that David Fincher is doing a World War Z sequel, or a sequel as I like to call it. Uh, that could be really cool. He's a great director, and uh, yeah. In other news, uh, speaking of dystopian futures, Amazon revealed the Echo Look, which is like an Amazon Echo, that little like hockey puck you talk into, except this one is like a camera 
that watches you in your home. Yeah. And then uh, just for reference, that's GLaDOS, another AI that watches you. Also known as my friend spyware. Yeah, what could go wrong? It's just one of those like, maybe don't, you know, like yeah. in horror movies where they're like, you don't go up the stairs, that's crazy. Maybe don't buy a camera specifically constantly online for your home. It's also it's like- It's just a bad idea. One of the things I saw for it is that it will take a, a scan a picture of you and then try different outfits on you. Like, I don't think you need a robot to help you do that. I think you should just you get an idea of what looks yeah. good in you, what feels good in you. Go to the store, try some clothes on, you know, do yeah. it. and then dress like an idiot, like we do. Yeah, exactly. Get shirts that have pictures of little animals on them. Oh, they like it. They like our goof. Oh, I don't maybe think not. I can't tell well, with them. They're, yeah, that's, that they're, was that was a mixed reception. Speaking of receptions, we got reviews in for Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Uh, they've kind of been floating out there. Uh, we pulled the Rotten Tomato kind of aggregate score. Friendly reminder, Rotten Tomatoes, not one person. Not a man. It's, a, it's an average. It's a bunch of them. Not what, a man named um, Tan Tomato. It's just a bunch of different people. Not Robert, one guy who doesn't like your favorite uh, movie. Robert Otten Tomatoes. <laughs> His parents were divorced and so they hyphenated. Once again, uh, hundreds of people. Yeah. Not even working in unison. Just everywhere. Yeah. It's called an aggregate. Yeah, but as of Monday, it's certified fresh. 85%. Uh, that's probably going to fluctuate a bunch as more and more people see what the was movie. The, what's the first one at? Uh, I'll I pull that up. I didn't check. Pull that up right now. Uh, but while you're doing that, I will pull some of these up. Uh, here's what some of the critics had to say. Let's start with Time Out. Uh, the characters are still fun to be around. The one-liners are still sharp. And the soundtrack is, of course, terrific. You know, I think we go into Marvel movies almost expecting them to constantly one-up each other. But it yeah. sounds like this one's sort of par for the course, but in a really good way. Uh, Collider kind of echoed that. Ultimately, Volume 2 can't quite live up to the legacy of the first film, but it's got everything you could want from a big superhero spectacle, and then some. Which, I, it feels like that's going to be sort of the running theme here, is yeah. that it's not really reinventing the wheel, but um, that's 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 okay sometimes, right? I mean, also, the first one had the element of surprise. Yeah. Like, nobody knew who the hell the Guardians were. It came out of nowhere. We were like, this could suck. Uh, what's what's the last, like, flawless James Gunn movie you've seen? And what's the last talking that? raccoon movie you've seen? Exactly. You know? I watch so, a lot of those on PB. Yes, and I get Canadian television. So the original Guardians of the Galaxy released in 2014 has a 91%. These guys are not happy with our show. They have a 91... No, really not. Come on, guys. We're not even done with the bit. Haters is what they call you. Okay. Well, bunch of evil, angry haters. Maybe, maybe when they have some more snacks, they'll feel better and enjoy our show. So more. the original Guardians has a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, that's that's a pretty damn awesome for comic book movies. Yeah. Especially released in the last few years. Those have kind of been all over the place. Yeah. Uh, the Independent said, The second Guardians of the Galaxy is Marvel Studios near its best. Spectacular, funny, and with a very likable self-mocking quality. That sounds great. Baby Groot's happy. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, then, of course, uh, Entertainment Weekly says, It's still a very good Marvel movie. At times, a very good one. Uh, I said that wrong. Uh, but it's a come down for the dizzying highs of the first installment. The laughs are still there, but they're less involuntary. Second movies have the worst thing going against them, assuming the first movie was good, which yeah. is just... They've got to one up it. And third, third slums, movies, yeah. You know. Third movies frequently have it worst if the second one actually delivers, because then it's like, how do you top that? I mean, what did they say about like, but less involuntary laughs? Like, what does that mean? Like, you force yourself to laugh more? Well, I think also again, like the first one, we didn't expect it to be funny. It looked yeah. like a weird like Star Wars knockoff with a raccoon in it. And then we went and saw it, and we're like, oh, this is super hilarious. Like, Chris Pratt's a really funny action star, and we weren't expecting a the, bunch of like '70s pop hits. The original is is funny within the first like 90 seconds yeah. too. Like when that guy's mask comes, when that guy looks at him, he's like, who? Yeah. Like that's great. You're all yeah. of a sudden like these we, these are a bunch of idiot characters. Yeah, Let's we fall didn't in love expect with them. that. Uh, anyway, Nerdist said the action is great, the performances are top notch, and the soundtrack is killer. 2017's first Marvel movie is impressively one of the best sci fi adventures you could hope to see. I defy anyone to watch this and not smile from beginning to end, which apparently a lot of the people who also write reviews of the movie were like, I will take your challenge, yeah. Nerdist. Um, the Guardian says it's fun, though Guardians of the Galaxy 2 doesn't have the same sense of weird urgency and point that the first film had. You would think uh, they had a title bias there. Yeah, I, I put that in there kind of as a goof. Also, mm -hmm. I have time and time out. Who will win in this contest of... Come on, please. It's not that bad. Was, all right, we're almost done. We'll get to we'll get through it, and it's and it's fine. All right. This is why we don't do a live audience anymore. You guys yeah. suck. All right. Anyway, uh, IGN, our very own Terry Schwartz, said the second film is far denser and has a few more pacing and story problems than the first. Still, it's a very good movie with one of the most emotionally impactful endings of any Marvel Cinematic Universe story yet. That sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, also, like, the first movie was about getting the gang together and, like, this kind of, like, they were sort of introducing villains. They had, like, kind of, they, I mean, they had carte blanche. And they're yeah. also not connected to the rest of the Marvel Universe. In this case, it's clear they're kind of building up to Infinity War and, like, there's, 
there, you've got this, you've suddenly got a team. They're actually, they've become the Guardians of the Galaxy. So giving them something to do is more of a challenge. Again, um, Time Magazine, not Time Out, regular time. They say Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 comes at us grinning from ear to ear for nearly two and a half hours. It's high on its own supply. Oh no, Baby Groot does not like that. That seems okay. It seems like it's having fun, right? Shouldn't movies have fun? I like that the Time Out was like, this was great, it was a good Time Out, and Time was like, time, time, no, no, it's yep. too exciting, too much fun, it smiles a lot, it was too happy, no thank you. No thank you. Um, Hollywood Reporter says, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 plays like a second ride on a roller coaster that was a real kick the first time around, but feels very been there, done that now. Again, roller coasters are fun things that people enjoy going on, so, I mean, sometimes, sometimes critics are maybe like, I don't know. What, what do you expect? Like, you want like an Oscar movie? It's, yeah. it's got a talking raccoon and a little baby tree this time. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I generally wonder like what the criteria for reviewing something like this is for some of the, I don't know, a little more strict yeah. clientele. Uh, we've there. got a review coming in right now from, from Twitch. Flint Mech says, My Guardians Volume 2 review, it has Kurt Russell. Kurt out of 10. I agree with that. Kurt out of 10? Yeah. How many Kurt's? It's a very like, Kurt review. Ten, very yeah, short. Very... <laughs> uh, then, of course, um, Irish Times. I like this one. This one's just, like, brutal. At its worst, it comes across like a vulgar birthday party hosted by an indulgent millionaire wow. for a hard-to-please stepchild. Oh, my so, God. First of all, is Irish Times like a bottom-shelf liquor? Because it sounds like it. I was going to make that joke, too. It, it really, really does. does. Yeah. And it um, sounds like they've been drinking bottom shelf. Like, they're surly over there. Yeah. Whatever. We needed that. There were you know, too many important. miniature horses and way too many rides. <laughs> Didn't like it. Almost had to hurl. All right, well, calm right, down. Thanks, guys. Uh, anyway, I'm really a excited. Goofy movie. Too much goofy, too <laughs> much movie. Blah! Does anyone really need an extremely goofy movie? Um, Let's ask my friend Bartles and James. <laughs> Um, yeah, like, I, I don't know. I'm excited about this movie. I think that expectations are really important, especially with Marvel movies. Sure. You know? uh, Guardians does have, again, like, I don't have any connection to those characters. I frequently just have, like, I, I come out of, like, X-Men movies just, like, ripping my hair out and just, like, yeah. like t t shredding up my tickets. Like, ah, oh, that Brian Singer did it again. He got it wrong. But, I, like, I don't know. Guardians has, like, a talking raccoon. I'm like, I think, all right. I think it's really <laughs> important to note, as all of us collectively sort of careen towards the next wave of Marvel movies, um, these things are going to get... Weird. They're going to change. They're going to get darker. They're going to get stranger. Uh, I think the comfort origin stories are all out of the way. Now we're just in the thick of it. Like, now we're in that part in comic books where most people are like, uh, they lost me. Like, that's the movies they're going to start making now. Like, when these guys start going to space and, like, when Spider-Man shows up and they're going to have, like, the fourth Iron Man movie yeah. or the seventh time we see the Avengers, it's going to get weird. And if you're down for that, like, yeah, you're going to have an awesome couple years. But if not, like, man, go watch the old ones again. Mm. Well, uh, Cyborg Man on, uh, on uh, YouTube chimed in to say that he thought that your Irish Times joke was not funny. And he says, I read the Irish Times. Well, I read Rolling Stone. That doesn't mean that Rolling Rock isn't a brand of beer, okay? Also, so there's, just, you know, there's, a, there's a joke. Just calm, we, just, we have a different type of humor here, uh, us here yeah. in the Irish. And see, our audience okay? loves Very it. Different. They think our goofs are hilarious. And let's cut to them right now and see how they're doing. They love it. I think the that, reviews I think are he, in. We have an 85% on Rotten Tomatoes, and they love us. I think he's dead. Like, Can I we think... get somebody to check on him? Uh, anyway. He's, right, he's, he's okay. He's alive. Right. He's alive. Anyway. Thanks for waking up to um, hate. <laughs> We had a really cool thing happen. Uh, we got the guys who made uh, What Remains of Edith Finch. An That's right. Uh, weird yeah, new, Ian, uh... Ian Dallas, the creative director of What Remains of Edith Finch, which is out now. Uh, we gave it a really good score. It's one of the most unique games I've seen probably in a very long time. That doesn't work. Unique is not a quantifier. Either is unique or it's not. It's a unique game, though, right? Because there's not another game that's like it, right? Anyway, let's check out What Remains of Edith Finch with Ian Dallas. Actually. Hey, guys. It's Brian Altano here with Ian Dallas. Uh, and we're playing What Remains of Edith Finch, uh, which is really cool because you made it. <laughs> you made uh, this game. Yeah, not single-handedly. Really? And, and not quickly. You didn't do the entire thing just like pixel by pixel yourself, did all the music, did all the Certain video. pixels I can claim. <laughs> uh, few, but. So this is your company, Giant Sparrow. Yeah. Uh, this game is done now, it's out. You've been working on it for, for quite a long time. Yeah, four and a half years. Four and a half years. How, how much have you changed as a person since this game began? Oh, uh, more than I realize, I'm sure. Uh, like, I feel like I've just been in a cave for the last three years. <laughs> so, you know, the light of the sun, for example, hasn't changed right. me uh, as much as it might have changed other people. Um, you point yeah, to me so... like one of the palest people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're inside of, uh, you know, an anechoic... You know, a lot of this is it's, we do video game stuff for a living, so this is, this is it. Oh, sorry. 
So the presentation of this game, um, how did it come together? It's, it's based sort of around books, right? Yeah, it's based on, um, well, I mean, the, the original idea was the sublime horror of nature. That was kind of like what we wanted to make a game about. And uh, that, that led us to looking at uh, this genre of, of fiction called weird fiction. Uh, people like H.P. Lovecraft, uh, you know, and um, Edgar Allan Poe, and Neil Gaiman, and, and those guys, uh, mostly guys, uh, writing about it, but, but a few, few women. And um, you know, like from the 1930s, sort mm -hmm. of this old form of literature. And you know, that, that led us to doing short stories, uh, because a lot of the stuff that I think works really well, like stories about the sublime horror of nature and about being in a universe that's stranger than you can possibly imagine, um, it's hard to keep that going. Sure. You know? uh, so, so yeah, we, we based on, on short stories and then also just, you know, kind of the idea of stories in general, the way that stories, uh, you know, kind of are inherently uh, murky. Like, you don't know for sure what happened. You're just getting, you know, Edith's version, essentially. Uh, and, you know, in the game, you're playing these short stories of, of the different family members and, and finding out how they died. Uh, but it's, you know, there's no point where you get the truth. It's just, like, Edith's version of it, of her experience of these stories. Oh, and so you're sometimes actually, stories inside stories. So you're consuming these tales kind of secondhand through her, which is, is not necessarily the truth. I yeah, I mean, she's narrating it for you, but she's, you know, deliberately constructing a story. Like, this is her impression of what happened. She doesn't have, like, a shaky VHS camera, you know, mm -hmm. that is ostensibly documenting all of this. So now, just surely on a technical level, uh, is this is sort of a, a tremendous true. leap over your last game, <laughs> Swan, which I really, really enjoyed. But uh, a game that kind of like reveled in its minimalism until it eventually uh, showed you the world that you were kind of painting little by little. Was it was it difficult to jump into something like this, which is so much more sort of just gigantic in scope? Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, we didn't jump into it. It's more like, you know, we got distracted and fell backwards into it. <laughs> uh, you know, it was something that uh, we wanted, you know, we wanted the stories to have a sense of... Um, you know, surrealism and abstraction and to be evocative of the emotional states, you know, that were involved. So those ended up being kind of naturally less realistic. Uh, so to balance that, we made the house kind of increasingly more realistic. Uh, we also ended up hiring, uh, midway through development, uh, a lead artist who had come from Call of Duty. Oh, interesting. Yeah, uh, not like necessarily the first person you would think, like, let me, no. you know, find someone for my, you know, bizarre indie uh, <laughs> title. But, uh, you know, he, he came from a more realistic lighting background, and, and he was really interested in uh, lighting in general. And I think that really comes through in the house. He did a fantastic job, uh, you know, lighting these, way, these spaces in a way that feels kind of believable, but also, you know, just a hair beyond uh, what you'd find in the natural world, uh, which was helpful for creating this, you know, kind of mid-ground of, like, it, it, it feels, you know, real, but not... Uh, you know, dull and, and not, you know, quite like it's all there. Sure. And I think that's kind of like a, a running theme for this game because the house is such a central character that was it difficult to, to sort of find the balance between making something that flowed well as a video game house but also felt like believably, you know, livable? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. No, uh, trying to find a, uh, a lot easier when I was you know, a, a middle ground there was, uh, was something that took a lot of iterations and you know I think in some ways the place where we're most successful is just where we have a chance to uh, have things accumulate uh, there's just a, a level of density that you know kind of magically turns it into something that feels uh, you know that goes from being mundane to being slightly overwhelming sure uh, you know so the house you know particularly when you're looking around you know, these spaces with uh, like family, photographs on all the walls uh, you know the hope is that it it kind of goes from being a very civilized space into being something that's, you know, almost like looking at the bark of a tree or, you know, an anthill or, or something that, you know, it's just like there's too much life. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I think your brain starts immediately being like, well, this is a quaint house. The lighting is warm. <laughs> but then things start tipping me off that things aren't going well, such as, like, a hundred cans of tuna. Right. Like, to me, that's immediately, like... Mom, Are we playing a Hoarders episode? <laughs> <laughs> like, what's happening talented. here? Yeah, and that, uh, I can't remember if we just triggered the text there or not, but, uh, you know, that the cans of, of uh, salmon, actually, you know, come from a story that you'll find, you know, in about an hour and a half from now. Uh, Edith's brother, Lewis, works at a cannery. Uh, so 
part of what we're doing is also, you know, setting up the stories that you're going to find much later in the game. Oh, interesting. Uh, there are little breadcrumbs then. Yeah, yeah, or exactly. chunks of salmon. So, like, right, yes. Chunks of salmon uh, dripping with possibility <laughs> uh, that we leave lying around the house. Uh, so these peepholes are another example of that, I where, uh, you know, you're, like, your very first couple minutes in the house, uh, you know, you can find these little pinpricks of detail, you know, that give you clues about what each of these bedrooms, you know, are, are going to be like. And, you know, it serves kind of two functions where, like, one, we're sort of foreshadowing, because uh, this game has got a lot in it. Uh, we want to tell people a little bit about what they're going to find so that when they find it, you know, it, it's something that feels like it's been prepared. And then we're also, at the same time, uh, trying to destabilize them a little bit and, you know, make the house feel even more overwhelming uh, than it otherwise would. Like, if you hit uh, the Options button, you know, you can bring up this pause menu. Oh, wow. And this shows you, like, all of the family members, uh, you know, we're simultaneously trying to make it understandable that, okay, this is essentially a map, you know, of, of this family that you're going to be exploring in these, you know, generations. Um, you know, but it, it also, at the same time that it, it makes it understandable, it makes it a little bit overwhelming as well. Right. Uh, because you can see wow, you know, I just played two stories and I have, you know, all these other stories left to go and you start to think about, you know, the connections between all these stories as well, which you can see in the family tree. Molly always now, seemed like a girl I could imagine. when you were a kid, did you it. live in, like, a weird it house? <laughs> like, did you have, like, a, like a labyrinthian sort of artsy, bizarro house like this one is? Uh, no, I wish. Uh, I, I lived in a fairly standard uh, two-story house. Uh, I think the strangest thing that ever happened uh, with regards to the house was one day, you know, probably like in middle school, <clears throat> it, you know, it was the summer, I was on break, and uh, it was just me and my sister at home, and we get a knock on the door, and there's a man who, um, I think he had a shirt on, but he was big enough that it didn't cover all of him. Right. Uh, in hindsight, I realized he was completely drunk. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but uh, he was like in his kind of late late thirties, early forties, and uh, he told me that he used to live in that in the house. That like I'd lived there, you know, for twelve years or whatever at that point. And uh, yeah, he, he told me that uh, the house had burned down, like the top of it, you know, had been rebuilt, and it kind of made sense afterwards. Like, oh right, the first floor does look kind of different. But, you know, it's amazing that you can live in a house for so long and not know the history of it. Right. Because generally, like, you don't meet the people that lived there before you did or the people, you know, before that. And, and even, you know, like one or two steps removed, a lot of that history gets lost. It feels like this was an actual kid's room. So how, how did you guys sort of nail that? Uh, well, I, I think we had uh, a lot of help from our level designer, Chris Bell, who, uh, you know, went through all of these rooms several times. Uh, you know, I think it, it generally took about three complete rewrites, uh, you know, where you'd sort of keep developing it and you get to a point where you're like, well, we're, we're getting better, but it's just, it's not quite there yet. And, you know, then we just have to start over. We say, right. okay, we learned some things, but we'll, we'll start over. And so that, I mean, that helps a lot with the pathing. So one of the things that's really impressive uh, to me now is looking at this house where things do feel lived in, but at the same time, there's kind of a natural flow that players have so that they don't get frustrated generally, they don't backtrack. They just feel like they're kind of moving through effortlessly. Uh, what we talk about internally is like falling down the rabbit hole, right. where we want people to just kind of, you know, move through these stories. Uh, you know, and balancing those things uh, was a lot of work. But of one of the things that also ended up being really helpful was just having a lot of time to spend in these rooms uh, in the process of making them. So, you know, each of these versions that we do, we'd keep a few things, and the rooms kind of develop this level of clutter and detail. Like if you, sorry, if you turn left here uh, and you go back over and you see like right here on the wall, there's this, uh, you know, mural, like a whole other pocket universe right. inside. Uh, there was something that didn't come in until a couple months ago. You know, we've been developing this thing for four and a half years and Molly's bedroom was one of the first places we started. But it's just like these layers. And before that was just a brick wall. It was a fine brick wall. Yep. I think there might've been like a little drawing on it. But, you know, it takes a while to have all these ideas, to throw out all these terrible ones. Um, so this is a point where people, you know, feel like the game has gone home, essentially, which I understand. It's a game about, you know, like a, a woman coming back to the house she grew up in the Pacific Northwest, yeah. in relatively modern times. Very similar. And then, you know, this is the stage where things change. And then people are like, oh, 
okay, this is not gone home at all. At all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know how many people now are going to be, you know, upset by that. A lot of people love Gone Home. Great game. Uh, you know, this when, when the reviews, doing some different things. When the reviews for Gone Home came in, everyone said, this is a, a perfect game because you never have to turn into a cat. <laughs> So this is this is really gonna upset a lot of people. No, this is great. Um, I think that there is uh, there is this weird sort of negative notion we've gotten over the last few years of like what a walking simulator is. And they're mm -hmm. like, well, you don't even get a gun in that game. <laughs> well, well, I mean, maybe you don't need a gun in that game. Like most scenarios, hopefully, don't involve solutions that are gun driven. <laughs> right. So uh, is it is it like were you guys conscious of that while making this game that like immediately some people put this thing in a box, but like. <laughs> How do you get people to go, but like, but hear us out? Like, there's, right, there's, well, there's a story here. There's a, a tale. You know, when you're, you're hitting us four and a half years into this, uh, when we first started, Gone Home hadn't even been announced. Right. You know, this is, I guess Dear Esther was around. That was a thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think it's something that we were very conscious of. Uh, you know, the kind of genre of walking simulator as a thing didn't really exist. I mean, there's just... Dear Esther really was the, the thing that, you know, you might have compared it to. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think our goal the whole time had been, like, how do we tell a story about the sublime? Yeah. Um, and it wasn't really, I mean, we weren't thinking about uh, what kind of box people would put it into. But that ended up being actually very helpful because, you know, like I said, a lot of people come in with an expectation and then we're able to, you know, subvert that and yeah. give them this, you know, genuine surprise. Like, which is always a tricky thing to find. Like I've seen, I've seen this game a couple of times now. We, I've, we've had different segments. You and I talked at PSX last year, um, and I haven't seen any of this stuff just yet. So like, this is the kind of thing where I was like, oh, this is a game where you walk around a house, and it's like, yeah. well, <laughs> not, not always, <laughs> right? Uh, no, this game is, uh, you know, similar to our last game, The Unfinished Swan. Uh, you know, we're trying to change up what the game is. Uh, pretty frequently so mm -hmm. that players never get comfortable enough to feel like they understand what's going on and then they can start achieving other goals. I mean, they're always in this kind of beginner's mind of trying to figure out what's going on uh, and then never getting comfortable enough you know, to, uh, to start to try to do anything else. Hopefully. Did you guys experiment with the owl controls at all I'm so that you could turn your head 360 degrees? Uh, that did not come up. Really? Uh, no, no. I think originally, you know, maybe it was more of a hawk or a bat. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to remember. I mean, this has gone through a lot of different versions. Sure. Uh, but, you know, in this case, like, one of the things that worked really well was just taking away a lot of freedom where you used to be able to uh, move, like, in three dimensions, essentially, like, descent, you know, mm -hmm. or, you know, just, like, to be flying around. That's kind of the first idea you might have of what a bird simulator might be like but because in this game you are an owl for you know maybe two minutes depending on how good of an owl you are uh, you know it actually made a lot of sense for us to strip down the controls a bit there sure. so that you have you know this kind of joyful experience of you know a little bit of trying to figure it out and then success you know and then you're, you're moving on and mm -hmm. you're not stuck at this point where you're coming to grips with what it means to be an owl and how an owl moves uh, and you're starting to wonder if maybe you should be able to turn your head around or, or whatever it is. But, uh... This is, uh, that was just a very surreal, bizarre and brilliant segment. <laughs> <laughs> I like that we're, we're having like a deep conversation about like what it's like to control an owl as yeah. a shark is rolling through uh, a highway. Yeah, That's there's great. a lot in this game. Mm -hmm. So were you, uh, like, at, at one point, you just, did you decide, like, I want to tell one story that involves it, but I, I want to see how many animals I can do. <laughs> uh, I mean, this story was very unusual in that it started with just the central image of actually that shark 30 feet up in a forest falling to the ground. Right. And thinking, like, wow, that would be a really odd moment. Um, that some, I, I don't know, that image just kind of came you know, like leaped out of my mind with nothing else attached to it. Uh, but it felt like it was somehow, you know, in a not obvious way related to this notion of, you know, the sublime and things that are beautiful, but also like kind of hard to understand. And uh, so, yeah, that, in that case, like we just started with this strange image and then worked backwards. And, you know, I, I think the idea of a little girl being very hungry, you know, came in somewhere and then everything else just kind of fell into place. I think that's incredible that, um, I, I don't know if a lot of people really think about game design like that. <laughs> I think that a lot of people probably 
go, oh, I want this game where you play as a shark, and then immediately you're like, well, the whole thing's underwater, right? Yeah. And then, like, that that goes in that box. But for you to come in and be like, well, we're making this game that's about these, like, sort of microcosmic stories, but what if there was also, like, a shark that fell from the trees? <laughs> and then you figure out a way to weave it in, I think is, is pretty incredible, because, like, why not, right? Yeah, and like, I, I think a lot of games are much more... Uh, mechanics driven and sort of convention based uh, you know where they're they're more uh, more of a dialogue with the games that came before them uh, and in this case you know we're more about like just a, a feeling and that feeling can take a lot of different forms you know if you're making a cover based shooter there's a more limited set of forms that that is yeah. going to take, yeah. um, for better or worse. I mean, I think there are a lot of advantages that you get with something that players are familiar with. They can kind of jump over this, you know, um, you know, potential frustration with the controls and then get on to the rest of the game. But for us, that's where we're interested in, you know, keeping players in that place of unknown. What's that feeling like to just be like, I worked on a game for four and a half years, it's out, everyone can play it. Is it just like, euphoric <laughs> like it feels surreal like I've, I've put out albums that's the closest i've come but like yeah. that's it's that sort of like release of like it's done it's out there like how does that how does that feel sure. uh well i think for me it's it's but primarily sure. relief that we didn't crash the plane <laughs> <laughs> you know that uh there were a lot of uh you know a lot of late nights and a lot of crazy ideas a lot of really bad ideas uh, you know, but we were able to winnow things down into something that, you know, everyone was happy with. And I think when I look around, I also just see, you know, like if you turn to the right there, like that, um, turn, sorry, the left. It, uh, yes, like the right, 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 straight. Yeah, so that whistle there, if you turn right again, look down. Yeah, so that's a whistle. If you get close to it and use the zoom, you can kind of see some details to it. It's incredibly intricate. Uh, that was originally going to be hanging on Molly's bed and you would be able to pick it up and then blow through it. And I think Ben Esposito, uh, the uh, designer who we had you know, doing these little quick prototypes, uh, did a version where you could like press the triggers and you know, kind of control your breath, and it was gonna be this really neat sound interaction. Uh, and that didn't happen, obviously, <laughs> uh, for a very good reason. You know, I think we, we just wanted to put our time elsewhere, and we realized, oh, doing a custom animation of that is gonna be a whole lot of work that you know, is better spent elsewhere, and we already have plenty of things in Molly's bedroom you know, to occupy players. Is, um, it, is, it, is it hard to rein in those little diagonals and deviations? Because <laughs> I mean, it seems like when you're making a game, you could just all of a sudden be like, uh, well, the, we spent six months in the owl whistle, and I don't know if it's working. <laughs> oh yeah, no, that's definitely, as a creative director, like the nightmare that you have led all of these people into a dead end, you know, <laughs> and, and wasted all of their time, you know, and been ambushed, you know, by the forces I of, uh, of you know, shipping. You uh, but at the same time, you know, there are places where you need to spend we that. Along, and, you know, things for suck long. for a long, long time. And then there's a moment when it comes together, you know, often when the audio comes in like and music. you're like, oh, right. Audio is the thing that makes this, you know, feel responsive. Right. Why, why didn't I do that? And then you're like, oh yeah, that happened the last time too. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lesson that's just hard to learn. There's a perverse joy in people breezing through something that you spent so much time on. Yep. Because uh, everybody does play it differently. And it's just kind of amazing, like, oh yeah, this whole world. Because like, it also, I think, contributes to feeling like after you finish this game, you feel like, wow, there's so many things that I probably missed. Mm -hmm. And probably you did. But a lot of things, actually, you would have seen because, again, uh, Chris Bell, our level yeah, designer, is very good at his job and, you know, put things in just the right places so that people are, are going to see it. But it once you get a level of density, great. there's this feeling of missing out that is like a, actually kind of a nice feeling at the end of this, that it's a world that feels a little bit larger and stranger than, you know, you can come to grips with, at least, you know, in one playthrough. So, Ian, this game is out now. Uh, where can people play it? Uh, they can play it on Steam or on PlayStation 4. Awesome. Uh, congrats on the launch. Congrats on four and a half years of hard work cum culminating into something so original and beautiful and cool. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for coming up at noon. It's oh, good to see you again, man. My pleasure. Good to and see you. We'll have to do this again in four and a half years. <laughs> I was going to say it. You said it. Uh, hopefully sooner, but um, uh, take your time, man. These things are very hard. Thank you so much for coming by, and thank, thank you. you guys for watching. And welcome back. Here we, we are once again. We did it. 
That looks like a, that looks like a cool game. Oh yeah, man, that is a gorgeous, really cool, like, really special game. That's definitely one of those ones I was kind of like not really wanting to watch too closely because I want to experience it for myself. I've been um, calling it one of the most unique games. <laughs> yeah, it definitely looks like one of the most unique games I've ever seen. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, once again, our sponsor this this month, week, whatever, is mm -hmm. uh, Cheez-It Groove. Uh, they are giving away a six-month supply of Cheez-It Grooves as well as a Nintendo Switch and a copy of Breath of the Wild. Uh, to win that, go to go.ign.com slash Cheez-It Grooves. The go is very important there because it lets the computer know that you want to go to that website. That's it. It's and that's that how computers work. And on that note... We want to play a, a nice cheesy level of Mario Kart 8, which is yeah. uh, coming out this week. So um, cheesy grooves are made of cheese. Uh, we started thinking about like some of our favorite cheese levels in games, which you'd be shocked. There's actually a surprising amount of them. Uh, we almost put together a list, but it was almost too much cheese. Yeah, there's to like handle. Worms World Party. There's, uh, I mean, I guess you could sort of count if you like fill an entire room with cheese wheels in Skyrim. That's sort of a cheese level. So um, a very long time ago, uh, Mario Kart came out for the Game Boy Advance. I bought it on day one. I actually called the GameStop like five days in a row, being like, "Do you have it? Do you have it?" And they didn't yet. And I got my friend to pick up the phone and called him, and he was like, "They were like, we know it's the same guy." Uh, that game had a cheese level in it, which they painstakingly recreated in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. You might have played it on Wii U. Uh, we're playing it on Switch right now. Yeah. Uh, so let's jump in there. We got some attire. Yeah, it's actually really important if you're if you're uh, being little Italian elves wearing the hats. You gotta wear headgear to just really just get in there. There we go. You ready for this? Yeah. This is, is this our first time playing this level together? Uh, it is, yeah. All right, we're so gonna do you it. might you might uh, kick my ass. Let's go for it. All right. Uh, so we put, we're playing with Joy-Cons split off on the side, and we put those little attachments mm -hmm. on them so you, and you can power the, slide easier. you got the good one. What's the good one? You got the good one where the, the joystick is a little bit lower. Ooh, cheese Ooh, that land. rock and jam. Mm. Big old canyons of fromage. Look at all that fromage, yo. All right. I want to eat this whole level. Come on. Those toads live here. They, hey. That's odd. Get out of my way, you weird turtle. Hey. So Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is out tomorrow. I already got hit with a red shell. This is going to be hard to do without cursing, I'll be totally honest with you. Cursing yes, it is, is. Cursing is definitely a thing I like to do during this game. You know, they originally called it Mario, oh! Mario Cuss. That was the working title for the game. Mario Cuss. Yeah. <laughs> So is there like a story behind this game, or why are these like all these little Italian men and turtles all racing the cars, huh? Um, you tell me. Anything you? Oh, come on! Damn it! Come on! Hey, dude, being uh -oh. like fifth, fourth, or third in this game is so difficult. You're just constantly getting hit from both sides. I don't know if I agree with some of the physics in this. I feel like if you if you just you rammed a just whatever that like a child a teenage squid from the back, like it'd probably get out of your way. You never know. I mean, you can't tell until you try ah, it in real life. Damn it! Come on. All Look right. at all this delicious cheese. If I was racing across this landscape, I'd get out of my small automobile and uh, and probably probably eat some of the ground. And that's why they rejected me from NASA on account of I wanted to eat the moon. Oh. Yeah! <laughs> We're playing on 100cc. I know some of you are like, that's for babies. Well, guess what? We're it's babies. It's a game for babies. Look at this. It's little tiny cars. It's not Forza. Forza's kind of for babies. Yeah, they added a Hot Wheels DLC, which is for babies. Yeah, babies love Hot Wheels. <laughs> nice Hot Wheel. Baby's first Hot Wheel. How are you doing back there? Good, good ghost. You seem to be doing okay. I'm getting my ass kicked. Good I haven't, place, I, huh? dude, I haven't even, come on. What? Yeah, I haven't even like I haven't played this level before. I've like played this for a second, so you've been playing. Have you been playing what, like a pro controller at home? Um, I mostly play a uh, pro controller. I'll play like this. I'll play uh, a little bit of everything. I do with the Joy-Con grip. Everything but that charging grip. Cause oh. I'm, not, I'm not about that charge grip lifestyle. Yeah. It's just not a good thing to have. Oh, get out of here, you son of a red shell! I think that's a I think that's a George R. R. Martin book. Son, Son of a, a red shell. shell. Yeah, it's actually Tom Clancy. <laughs> uh, Are you collecting on. coins? That's your problem, Max. I'm get getting. It. I'm trying to get the coins. I'm trying to steer with my large. Oh, fingers come with on with the funny nubbins. Like I said, very very difficult to not curse. 
Yes, that's true. It's hard to not curse. I'm on the third lap and I just got passed by this dude. Oh! Ooh. Oh! Oh, this oh, is beautiful. Come on. This is beautiful. Fart and Bring hat. it home. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes. No, you. F no, the bomb! Oh, no, you. F oh, are we playing a baby mode? I'm trying to go off the ramp. Are you kidding me? Who threw that bomb at the end? I will fight you. So this game it really brings the best out of people. We're in ninth. We're playing. I got the. We got the camera covering up. Ten. Come on. Why'd you even show me that? It is like it's very very difficult to not. Eleventh place. To not just say all the worst words. And I have a hand cramp, so that's good. Oh, you got beat by Cat Peach. <laughs> Are we even allowed to say Cat Peach on this show? I think we can. Yeah. Anyway. Oh. <sighs> That was intense. Good job. How do you feel? I'm all right. I think um, I got screwed up by this this green hat. I don't wear a lot of green hats. That's true. That's true. Yeah. That must uh, be it. But you can wear a green Seriously. hat uh, when you go buy this game because we found out about something very cool this week. Um, man, thank you so much to Cheesy Grooves for letting us play that cheese level and um, keeping me just really teaching me about temper is the yeah. thing I'm learning more you've, about. You've learned to be a much kinder, more patient man. Uh, how's the audience doing? Let's see what they made of this. All right. Hey, man, like, come on. Really? I mean, uh, I thought it was exciting. Well, it looks like that cheese level made him hungry. Mm -hmm. What? Where did we find these people? Hey, what the? That's Mike. He posts this to YouTube. Mike, quit it. I'm, I know him. We're friends with him. <laughs> We're not even getting that, like, friend bump. I think they just made them, I think they made them come in. Anyway, anyway. Uh, if you're going to buy Mario Kart 8, you can buy it digitally or you can buy it in a store, uh, but a really cool store you can do that uh, is Target. Not to plug Target, but Target's doing something really cool this week. Um, 650 Target stores nationwide are becoming Mario Kart themed. So yeah. what does that mean exactly? It means that well, they're- Well, first of all, it wouldn't be a store without carts, but what if those carts were, were Mario Karts? Yeah. Get it? So this is weird. Uh, this is the first time Target has ever actually reskinned their shopping carts. So it took a little twist of the arm and a couple of blue shells from Nintendo to do this. But you can actually get in these things and push each other around the store. Highly dangerous. I recommend not that's doing just that. Gonna, that's just going to turn the whole store into like a Mega 64 video. That's a terrible idea. Or jackass. Idea. They yeah. sell bananas there. Like people are going to make a mess. Exactly. That's my plan. Yeah. Uh, there's there's also, now things, I didn't know this word. I learned a new word today. It's called bollard. I don't like that word yeah, at all. Yeah, bollard are these giant stone balls that live outside of a target. That sounds like a British band from the 70s. Yep. I don't like it at all. Uh, never mind the bollards. So this actually stops cars from crashing into them, uh, and they skin them with these giant Mario and Luigi faces, which is which is yeah, wonderful. I think when, when Pokemon Go was blowing up, people were repainting these to look like Pokeballs. That's right. Yeah, they tried that for that, too. So this I don't is think really that was Nintendo sanctioned. In this case, they were like, uh... Let's have, I, I feel like they should have done Chomp Chomps, but I guess those are like not, I, they're not as iconic as... Uh, I think they scare people away. Yeah, they're like, yeah. oh, we shouldn't go in Target. There's large spherical dogs outside. Yeah. <laughs> and last but, but not least, when you walk through the doors, uh, the motion-triggered sound effects start going off, and you cross a finish line, which starts making racing noises and the, uh, the countdown sound. So that's pretty awesome. I actually want to go in a store and do this right now. So uh, I actually mocked up a little bit of... Uh, of, of wonder of what this would look like if we did this in real life with a bunch of like actual animals and wreckage and fire. Right. Let's take a look. All right. I. Yeah. Why did they get? Why did they give you Photoshop? Because of this. I guess you did a good job with the boo. You got like a he got like the opacity all down. I wanted to put a woman in a bicycle upside down on a ceiling while a man underneath walks by like there's no big deal. I feel like this is we're gonna see a rise in teenagers getting kicked out of Target this month on account of this promotion because yeah. it's like you've got Mario Karts. Like, what is this? Is This isn't, like, a game about driving safely. This is a game about, like, shooting ghosts and eating mushrooms and driving into stuff. Like, yeah. it's going to get messy. People are going to try to drift the carts. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited this game's out. Um, you know, like, a lot of people are like, why would you buy this again? I mean, it's portable now, right? Like, that's a big thing. Like, Max and I have a flight across the country next week oh, for so a cool excited. video shoot. We're both going to sit there on an airplane and play Mario Kart 8 together on our own screens. Like, yeah. That's kind of amazing. That's a, like, great, that's a great time. Um, so, maybe you're more of a PlayStation gamer. I know we are sometimes. We host a show called Podcast Beyond. Big fans of PlayStation exclusives and all the wonderful characters that come with them. Now, uh, something that's been happening that's really cool for the last few years is we've been wanting more merchandise on the PlayStation side. We usually see it with Nintendo, not so much with PlayStation. 
We have uh, a little exclusive to show off here. These are called Stubbins. These are and awesome, yeah. This is Alloy from Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, we've got Sweet Tooth over here from Twisted Metal. We've got Clank, everyone's favorite robot. And uh, Max's favorite animal in the world, the raccoon. Yeah, raccoon. little Sly Cooper. Little I like him. Over He's here. great. So these are available uh, May 31st. This is the second season of these two, or the second set. Yeah, we've had a few more. I think we talked about the first wave on the show. Yeah. Uh, here's what they look like. I love that they'll have like the really the cutesy stuff. You know, you get like the raccoons and the rapid dogs. But then you also are like, yeah, here's a, you know, here's, here's Sweet Tooth, the murderous <laughs> clown. Or uh, as with we got boxer the, shorts on. The, I love them. In the for, first line, we got uh, we got the Bloodborne man. Yeah. With a funny hat with the torn up on the sides. Yeah, so Nathan Drake, obviously he's in like a, he's in a bunch of T and M rated games. Like he gets into some stuff. You know, Prepper the Rapper, I think, drops a few bad words here and there. But mm -hmm. yeah, the Bloodborne guy literally covered in blood. Um, but you can you can buy these now. That's the first set, and you can pre-order the second set. So these go for about 13 bucks each. Um, if you can find them, so they're they're available right now on the PlayStation Gear Store, which yep. is a store I didn't really know about, but you can pre-order them now. Uh, get them on them fast because I think these will go quickly. Um, and you don't really get to see a lot of like sort of like soft, cutesy versions of your favorite PlayStation characters like this. Yeah, I dig these. I feel like they also go really well if you got a bunch of like little anime plushies and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Also, if you're right if in. you're a hardcore Twisted Metal fan, I mean, this is probably the most merch you're going to get out of that game in 2017. They don't. Really yeah, do no, a lot totally. Of same with uh, same with like the Parappa the Rapper. Yeah. Um, and you know, Clank's got this little like antenna on him. I, I really love these. So yeah, they're called the Stubbins. Uh, you can find all about them right here on. Uh, Twitter.com slash the underscore Stubbins, Instagram.com slash the Stubbins, Facebook.com slash the Stubbins, and gear.playstation.com slash N dash US. You just Google slash. the Stubbins, it probably yeah. is a good way to do it. You yeah, know. that's right. You so figure it out. Yeah, 13 bucks each. Put a bunch of them on your desk. Uh, you want these things because they're yeah. adorable. Or you can head over to my DeviantArt page and see more stuff like this. I really like, mm. oh, that's good. Are you making them kiss? Mm. You can make them kiss. Mm. I like how they did her hair, by the way. That's very nice. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, so yeah, merchandise, merchandise, merchandise. That's uh, one way of handling the it. The three rules of real estate. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe you've got a ton of money lying around and uh, buying a couple of like sort of smaller scale things yeah. is not really your jam. You want something really expensive. Max, what do we have today? Well, here's something good. Uh, so. Guardians 2 is coming out soon, mm -hmm. and everyone loves Groot. There's baby Groot going around. There was a weird Uber promotion going around where I think they were like bringing in select cities just random Groot toys to people. And you know, there's obviously like plushies, and you got like a. Do we really have a bunch of the same one? We, I guess no, we, we actually yeah, we, go. we actually got a yeah. couple delivered to it's the funny office. Funny little baby Groot. So yeah, Uber was actually delivering Groots to the office. I like so. this. What is? Has he got like a hot dog? What is? It? Oh, that's actually someone's keychain is attached to this. His little legs. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of different Groot toys you could get. Uh, Hot Toys, we talk about all the time on the show, they do just crazy high-end like replicas and collectibles. Normally they do one six scale figures of like, you know, just a, a human person shrunk down to be 12 inches tall. In this case, Baby Groot is about that tall in the movie, so they just made a life-size Baby Groot, which is about the size of a little baby. Uh, and here's what it looked like. looks like. Uh, I think this will run you probably, uh, do we have the, the price on this? I think it's a probably about two or three hundred bucks. Uh, but he's got like clothes. I think it's weird to be like, Groot didn't wear clothes in the first movie. But now he's wearing clothes, so now it's sort of weird when he's not wearing clothes. You know? Yeah. Like, that kind of makes me just... I don't know how I feel about that. He looks uh, so damn snuggable in that thing. Doesn't he just look like the most comfiest dude? Like, just a Saturday? I want to wear that. I want to wear one of these I weird really little want, like, burlap sack with zipper. It looks like, like a could, onesie with huge zippers on it. you just wear a messenger bag, that looks cozy he's, as hell. He's like 10% sack boy here. Yeah, there's definitely some sack. He's, he kind of looks like a, like a Funko Pop, but mm -hmm. he's got, but like if you like left it in the wilderness for a while and it was forced to fend <laughs> for itself. Uh, but yeah, Baby Green has got all these, you know, he's super articulated. You can pose him in a bunch of ways. Uh, you got, he's got the tendrils so he can like Kill people. It can be scary. Yeah, uh, and then there's this pose, which I don't like one bit. I feel like the next time somebody's like, "Hey, uh, if, if they're like trying to solicit you for nudes, you should just send them that." Be like, "Yeah, I like to, I like to stretch out now and then." I'm a little log boy. Why get so weird? Why? Okay, that's odd. Look at yeah. those funny feet. Yeah, somebody's right. into it. Okay. Yep. There's that picture again. We yeah, can we can at. keep showing that for a while. Can uh, we show that picture one more time? You want to see it one more time? Let's take a look at that picture. There we go, one more time. Are you trying to get them to put like your face over the Groot face no, or something? No, I'm not. Gonna I'm do just that? saying it looks very relaxing, and I'm very happy he's there having a really good time. You're trying I don't, to make they have a camera for me to, okay. to do that today. All right. Um, 
We yeah. talked about Bloodborne a little bit earlier. We showed you the Bloodborne Stubbin, which you can get for 13 bucks. It's cute and adorable, but once again, uh, yeah. we, we want to sort of help people with the entire breadth of their wallet. Yeah, we understand that uh, some people, some of you just like, you know, railroad barons out there, after you've, <laughs> after you've uh, opened coal mines and, uh, you know, bought like beautiful estates in the North Shore, maybe you want to spend money on something else. Well, good news, because there's a, bl a Bloodborne statue that's $600. Yeah. We've, so, we've noticed that we've had at least a hundred or so lottery winners in our comments recently. So let's let's, let's appeal to them yeah, for a second. So this is, uh, let's see, this is Lady Maria of the Astral Tower. She's from the Old Hunters DLC, I think. Uh, Sideshow Toy is distributing this. This is made by Prime One Studio. Um, but basically, Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower, as, I mean, I'm a big fan of Bloodborne, so I, of course, know that she was a citizen of Canehurst and is directly related to Queen Annalise. However, she was one of the first hunters to join the nightly hunt, studying under German, the first hunter, and despite being a citizen of Canehurst who relished in their extravagant uses of blood, she favored Rukuyo, who required dexterity and skill rather than blood to wield effectively. Uh, and at an unknown point in time, Maria forfeited her beloved weapon, tossing it down a well when she could stomach it no longer, and disappeared mysteriously into the hunter's nightmare. Now, Maria resides in the Astral Clock Tower, looking after the, you know, the disfigured patients and all them uh, that live there, and guarding the, you know, the secret of the nightmare. Everyone, of course, who, who plays the Old Hunters know what I'm talking about. Um, the, it's at the entrance to the fishing hamlet where, of course, the Orphan of Kos can be found. And she sits in this chair, as we see with the statue, and, uh, you know, she's seemingly lifeless. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, until the hunter tries to touch her. Uh, I'm just kidding. I have no idea what any of that means. I was, I was just say, reading you, from a press release. You wussed out on that game super hard. I was like, yeah, I was wow. Like, you're... That guy hit me with a broom. I want to go home. <laughs> Somebody read the War and Peace Cliff Notes before school. Yeah. Uh, but no, here's some, here's some closer looks at these. This is, this is gorgeous. This thing's about 20 inches tall. Uh, they didn't say how much it weighs. I would guess like probably like 15 pounds. It's probably like poly or resin. Uh, but I love it just like this this lady just sitting in a chair. You know what's um, great about that chair? It's come, it comes with a little table. You can put little sandwiches on there and really just like spice it up, make it look fun. Little, give her a little martini. I like you could totally you could totally mod this and, and set her up to be just like a total like just like a gamer and just put like snacks and sodas and stuff there. Just leave a bunch of like like old old socks and crap on the floor and just be like, wow, Lady Maria's really let herself go. It's nasty. Uh, she does come with this. Which, of course, as all Bloodborne fans know, is the portrait of Miriam Granderlurgen after being hurled down the well of Kern Finas. Do you not have a Wikipedia page? I have for that no one? idea what that picture frame is. <laughs> you I could kinda, put anything you want in there, though. You could. You could put like a little picture of like, I'd like Sly Cooper and be like, "Oh, my Sony fan fiction's coming <laughs> true. That woman loved a raccoon." Um, but then, if you get it from Slideshow, you get an exclusive diecast goblet that you can fill with all kinds of stuff. Or just put on the little table, whatever. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think you should put peanut M&Ms in there. It'll look funny. It's always weird. Oh, hey, uh, look at that. You hey can have a little boy. Groot goblet. No, I think it's always so funny when they have like... Gooblet. Wait, a gooblet. Uh, when they have like just the craziest, like highest end collectibles. And then they're like, but if you buy it from one retailer, you get an extra shoe. And you're like, what? What's going on there? <laughs> That's strange. I think there was... I think you have a like a Bib Fortuna from Sideshow. And they had like the exclusive variant that comes with... One of those frogs that Jabba eats. And like, it doesn't make any sense. It comes right. with somebody else's food. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's like if Lando came with Yoda's Lara Bar. Lara Bar? It's a Luna Bar, man. Any crazy person. No, I'm calling it a Lara Bar. Those Lara are good bar? too. Don't you know what a Lara Bar is? Yeah, I don't, I don't think they're canon, though. I think they took those. That's a Legends. That's a Luna Legends. Bars aren't canon either. All right. Anyway, um, Darth Bohoy says, well, Brian reads Max can't. I can read. I read that whole thing from the 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 Bloodborne statue. See, I read that off the screen. that's a Lara bar. That's a picture okay, of it. Okay, right fine. There. Numerous photos of Lara bars. Get that out of here. Anyway, um, so here's the thing we, we talk about sometimes. Uh, Konami. Now, Konami's a company. Oh, he that, said a bad word. Yeah, I don't, don't get mad at me, please. I didn't, we're, we're just, we're just, we're just reading the news. Yep. Uh, Konami kind of pissed off a lot of people when they sort of had their outs with Kojima, uh, and then there was going to be a new Silent Hill game, and mm -hmm. then it ended, and they're usually known for throwing a bunch of DLC and stuff, and they're like, hey, great news, everybody's new Metal Gear game coming out. It's a pachinko machine. And then they just like go and they dive in their pile of money. Um, so they just put out a bunch of stuff for Super Bomberman R, which yeah. weirdly enough 
is cool. Yeah, so Super Bomber and R was one of their first times in a long time that they kind of reached into their sort of treasure chest of classic franchises. We haven't really seen a lot from a lot of their most beloved stuff. I mean, honestly, since Metal Gear, they haven't been the best at fan service. Yeah. I mean, they're making Metal Gear Solid survive, which is like, that could go either way. Yeah. Who knows? Totally. Um, but in terms of like a bunch of other classics like Gradius, Silent Hills, and Bomberman, and you know, most importantly, my personal favorite, Castlevania, we haven't heard anything in a very long time. But Bomberman launched on the Switch. Um, it was okay. It was pretty good. It had a lot of good ideas in it. It had a couple of problems, but for the most part, like it's kind of a return to form for the franchise. Uh, they just updated it recently. Uh, it's now at 60 frames per second. They added a bunch of new uh, multiplayer maps. It's sort of taking a hit in resolution, but the controls I mean, are better. And that you know, kind of makes sense, though. I feel like a game that's all about like hectic, like twitchy yeah. stuff. Like the frame rate's more important than yeah. getting. Like it's Bomberman. He doesn't have fingers. What, what are you going to do with it in 1080p? It doesn't really. But the coolest part of this sort of good guy Konami return to form is that they are putting out free DLC. Konami is putting out free DLC. That's a sentence I really just said in 2017. Weird. And it's uh, free DLC based on classic franchises. Yeah, so let's take a look at some of the concept art uh, that'll go into this. These will be for free uh, in Super Bomberman R. We've got Vic Viper from uh, Gradius. Um, we've got Pyramid Head from Silent Hill, which this is, is just awesome. awesome. Look at that belly with the guts pop 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 out. Look at those out. funny pants. This is gross. And then... Uh, uh, and, and most importantly, Simon Belmont, That's which is awesome. just the cutest thing I've ever seen. Like, I really want that, like, on a t-shirt. Uh, let's see. Mighty Gero on, uh, on Twitch says, did they cancel the Metal Gear Online? I don't know if they did. Yeah, I'm not did sure they? about that. I don't think they canceled the last one. I think the regular one's still going. Yeah. I keep, like, logging in there and just being like, it'll be like, you've got 7,000 new updates. And I'm like, eh, I don't want to open all these things. So these character skins are coming to Super Bomberman are, uh, pretty soon. Um, hopefully very soon, because I can't wait to try Simon Belmont. But what I want to ask you, Max, is do you think this is like baby steps into them being like, hey, that's right, people love our classic stuff. Super Bomberman R is one of the best-selling games in the franchise all of a sudden. Uh, the right place at the right yeah. time. Well, I mean, it was Switch one of launch. the four launch games for Switch. Yeah, no, totally. goes a long way. But, I mean, Bloodstain's happening from the um, Igarashi who worked yeah. on Castlevania. Can they reach into the vaults, maybe hire some younger people to, like, make a new Castlevania, I mean, make a new Gradius? That'd be really cool. I know that, um, what was it? The, it was the... the Princes of Darkness or whatever. Was that was the one that was like a sort of third person action Castlevania mm. that was like almost doing its own thing. Uh, a lot of people love that, but they're like it's not sort of really what we want from Castlevania proper. Yeah. Um, I think they I think they really they made a lot of enemies with uh, with what happened with Silent Hills and Metal Gear, but like again, they do have like all these like legacy characters. I'd kind of love it if they were like, "Hey, uh the first I don't know, five Metal Gear games are, are pretty perfect. Like, yeah. let's remake them using that beautiful engine that the creator made. And Dude, like, that'd be awesome. Or, like, um, hit up, hit up like, Yacht Club games or Way Forward and be like, hey, here's a Castlevania license. Like, yeah. make a new 2D Castlevania. Like, there was a couple years there where we got a 2D Castlevania every other year, and it was glorious. Yeah. And then it just stopped. Yeah. I'm excited to see what Metal Gear Survive looks like. Like, what happens with that? I don't know if I'll love it or hate it or whatever. It's just, it's mechanics of one of my favorite games ever made. Totally. But then it's like co op and survival. And I'm like, that's curious. And there's no snakes or big bosses or Vulcan Ravens or anything. Yeah, in I'm there. excited to do some less plays um, with you at the yeah. very least. Like, you know, that'll be fun. Yeah. But I mean, we're just, uh, we're just us. Uh, let's see what our audience thinks of Konami. I'm, I'm sure yeah. they love everything we've been doing to. I mean. What is he? Just, why are they all. What? He, she probably had a meeting or something. They're leaving? Just straight up walking well, out. Well, I mean, it is almost that time. It's almost time for us to wrap things up. Uh, well, Cheese at Grooves was nice enough to provide us with the audience. The audience sort of paid attention, I guess. So, you know, there's that. Uh, what have you got? Uh, you've got a new show coming up. Or That's right. Uh, the Together. 10th episode of Link Together is today. Uh, I hope you like it. We didn't accomplish a ton, but really, friendship is not just about, like, accomplishment, you know, things. It's, it's really just about getting... Yeah. Just getting through some stuff together. So that goes up today, 3 p.m. Pacific time on IGN and YouTube. Uh, so go check that out. Yeah. Uh, we put up a brand new episode of Podcast Beyond yesterday. Yeah, we talked a bunch awesome. about a lot of big stuff. We're, we're hitting that point again where there's actually new games and stuff to talk about. So we talked about uh, Call of Duty and What Remains of Edith Finch and Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. So go check that out. That's also on youtube.com slash uh, IGN or IGN Beyond. And then just I just look at, just let her look around for, mm -hmm. look under the covers. And next corner. week we are doing the show on May the 4th. Yeah. So uh, expect a lot of Star Wars stuff. We're going to make that a very Star Warsy show, plus lots of other stuff too. Um, so thank you guys so much for watching today. Max, yeah. we did it. This is a That's fun, it. This is a fun hour. The show's over. We get to go have snacks. Oh yeah, we get to eat snacks now. Snacks. Yes. We'll see you guys next week. Bye.